Was Marcion not right? The problem with Paul, from Marcion's point of view, is that he doesn't quite say what Marcion wants him to say. Paul has deep respect for the Jewish scriptures and for the prophecies. But all of this is edited out by Marcion in order to make Paul's message more shrill, more anti-Jewish. Can you not have a Christianity that is completely distant from the Old Testament? Oh, Marcion was putting his finger on a very tense problem for Christianity because, of course, in all sorts of ways, Jesus himself was disagreeing with aspects of Jewish law. And early Christianity had to free itself from the close observance of Jewish law if it was going to become a great world religion. It's just that Marcion's answer is so radical. And not only do the Old Testament and New Testament have nothing in common, but there are actually two different gods responsible for them. That's such a radical statement that it caused shockwaves in early Christian communities. So convinced of his thesis was he that Marcion had the audacity to summon the most influential men in the Roman church to a church council, the first ever recorded. But when he presented his ideas to them, rather than being hailed as a genius, he was condemned. The Christian leaders refunded the very generous donation that he'd made on his arrival in Rome, and then they promptly excommunicated him. Although condemned, Marcion's influence didn't die. If the hierarchy of the church disagreed with the texts in his canon, they would now have to come up with their own. Marcion's president forced them to start making decisions about sacred scripture themselves. By the end of the third century, there were over 20 gospels, numerous letters attributed to different apostles, and various other texts recording the life of Jesus and his followers, all circulating in the Christian church, nearly 80 in total. So how on earth have so many been lost to us until relatively recently? What exactly happened that led these writings to disappear from history? Certainly Marcion played his part, but he was by no means the only factor he was merely a catalyst that began a process that took centuries to complete, the formation of the New Testament canon. The Basilica of St. Peter's is one of the most potent symbols of Christian orthodoxy. Benedict XVI, the present Pope, he's a representative of the winners of that ancient battle between rival Christianities. And today you just can't help stand in awe of the spoils of that victory. But how exactly did the winners get the upper hand? Obviously, Marcion's canon focused the minds of the leaders of the Rome church on the idea of a selection of texts. But there were other factors, other considerations that informed the decision as to which texts were and which definitely were not appropriate for the eyes of their congregations. This is believed to be the exact site of Peter's martyrdom at the hands of the Romans. He was crucified upside down. And with his death and those of the other disciples, who were the eyewitnesses to Jesus' life and teaching, there was a growing feeling that it was important to agree 
once and for all on the facts about Jesus' life. Otherwise, anyone could come along and claim to have had a new divine revelation which superseded the old. There had to be a line drawn somewhere. So why was that line drawn at the collection of texts we have in the New Testament today? Why the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, and why not those of Peter, Mary and Thomas? Well, St. Peter's martyrdom wasn't an isolated incident. The statues around St. Peter's Square of the martyrs of the church are a stark reminder of the kind of problems the early Christians were facing. The Romans slaughtered thousands of them in brutal and dehumanizing ways in such a climate. Any gospel or letter that didn't speak directly to the suffering of people simply wasn't going to catch on. The Christians facing persecution were always going to reject those texts in which their saviour didn't lead by example. So deceitic works like the Gospel of Peter, in which Jesus himself never really suffered on the cross, were singularly unhelpful. And in a battle for the survival of the fittest, they were bound to fall by the wayside. But perhaps the factor that most influenced the selection of any text was its authorship. For a book to be included, it had to be the authentic work of an apostle. So how did the early church leaders decide which texts were the genuine work of apostles and which weren't? With some difficulty, this is the short answer. Um, obviously, those texts that claimed to be by an apostle, those that had, had an apostle's name in it, so, you know, uh, the, the Apostle Paul to the Romans or to the Corinthians, that helped. It at least made it worth discussing. Um, in other cases, texts seem to have acquired apostolic authorship, as far as we can tell, simply by tradition. In the case of the Gospel of Matthew, which is attributed to the Apostle Matthew, or in the case of the Gospel of John, attributed to the Apostle John, Neither of these texts says it was written by these people, and yet from the very earliest references to them, uh, by name, they are ascribed to such figures. So um, if you ask, well, how did that happen? And the answer is, I don't know, nobody else knows for sure. It happened so early, but it appears to have been obviously something other than the text claiming, claiming it to be so and its, its claim being accepted. It appears to have been just a kind of tradition that was associated with these texts. What about the Gospel of Thomas? The Gospel of Peter. Yeah, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Mary, Gospel of Philip. All of these explicitly claim to be written by those figures, and these figures are, you know, apostolic generation figures. And yet all four of them were not included in the canon. One of the things they had going against them was it appears that they were written actually, in their present form at least, uh, significantly later than the canonical Gospels. They got a late start, and they didn't make it. Those that had been written earlier and had more of a chance to circulate and to make their claim and to get that claim accepted, if they were able to do so, stood a better chance. And so, very gradually, a consensus of opinion began to form. By the mid-2nd century, hundreds of churches across the Roman Empire had started to decide, informally at first, which texts were and which weren't to be included. For a number of books, the debates were relatively muted, but others generated considerable disagreement. The Shepherd of Hamas, a book of visions, was hugely popular in the early centuries of the church, appearing in lists of accepted Christian literature until as late as the 5th century. And then suddenly it dropped out, judged to be too recent and written not by an apostle but only the brother of a bishop therefore not holy scripture 